Yeah, so here are some thoughts on the recent passing of Nelson Mandela, who died a few days ago at the age of 95. Now, the general story, of course, is that he was a freedom fighter who conscientiously resisted the racist apartheid regime of South Africa, was sentenced to prison for 27 years uh, for resistance to state tyranny, and then was freed and loved his enemies and was the president of South Africa, and then retired to travel the world and smile beatifically at a wide variety of people and meet his favorite band, the Spice Girls, I kid you not. Well, like most things that are talked about in the media, there's not an overabundance of truth in the uh, story. So let's look at some of the facts about this. Um, I've actually spent some time in South Africa. My father worked there and has since retired from his uh, job as a geologist. I know a little bit about it. I'm certainly no expert, but I will provide sources for everything in the description bar. So Nelson Mandela got his start as the head of Mkonto Wisizwe, which is the terrorist, ring, a terrorist wing of the African National Congress and the South African Communist Party. He claimed for many years to have not been a member of the South African Communist Party, but since his death, uh, documents and the Communist Party themselves have revealed that he was. He was the head of this terrorist wing and ordered massive numbers, uh, amounts of, of public bombings, 156 acts of public violence uh, he pled guilty to, including mobilizing terrorist bombing campaigns which planted bombs in public places. And he was head of this for two years before he was arrested in 1962. The terrorist wing then went on to put bombs in, in churches, in shopping centers, particularly around Christmas, and resulted in the deaths of many children, uh, women, uh, men, and of course, whatever beefs you have with your political regime, you can scarcely hold children responsible, though many of them were murdered by this group that he was the head of, again, after he left. Now, I have tried my best to try and find any sources for death counts that may have occurred on the bombings that he actually ordered, uh, but that information does not seem to be available. Again, if you know any, I'd be happy to do a, uh, a follow-up. So his uh, MK terrorists uh, did, murdered, uh, did murder a lot of uh, innocent people, and he did not renounce the violence. He's never condemned them. And so he was put in jail for ordering lots of bombings, um, you know, similar to what happened in Boston and uh, what happened in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City and so on. Uh, every government in the world would have locked this guy up. Uh, he was found with over 50,000 landmines, which had been sent to him by the communist government in Russia and a wide variety of other anti-personnel weaponries and so on. So he was the head of a terrorist army. This, of course, does not justify the evils of apartheid and so on, but we'll get to that in, uh, in a little bit. He refused to renounce violence. In fact, President Bota uh, visited him uh, and offered to release him if he would say, stop bombing people or authorizing or approving the bombing of people. And he said, no, uh, he would not. Even when he was bombing what he called um, uh, strategic targets, which were uh, power lines and, and uh, generating stations and uh, sewage stations and so on. He said that he aimed to not take human life, but if this didn't work, he would be more than willing to escalate to what happened later, which was the targeting of innocent people. And so if you've set off a lot of bombs, you're sitting on a lot of weaponry, and you refuse to renounce violence. In fact, you approve of the murders that occur in the terrorist group that you founded and were in charge of, then it's really not very common for people like that to get released from prison. So I just wanted to point this out. Uh, Amnesty never took his case. Amnesty International was not a prisoner of conscience uh, because um, uh, the, the, the movement recorded that it could not give the name prisoner of conscience to anyone associated with violence, even though, as in conventional warfare, a degree of restraint may be exercised. Now, when he became the president of South Africa, he purchased um, 25 to 38 billion rands worth of uh, weaponry, uh, maritime helicopters, new submarines, advanced fighter aircraft, battle tanks, and so on. 
Uh, he was very friendly with um, dictators around the world, in particular uh, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, President Suharto of Indonesia, and who is a massive fan of Fidel Castro, the dictator in Cuba, of course. And uh, this is uh, pretty, uh, pretty essential and pretty important to, uh, to understand. Uh, this doesn't mean that the South African government was moral or good or anything like that, but it is important to have an accurate history of the man. He was a devoted and dedicated uh, communist. He wrote an entire treatise on how to be a good communist. Now, you may feel differently, but I think, f uh, certainly for myself, with some pretty strong historical evidence, if I said he'd written a treatise on how to be a good Nazi, you'd be pretty shocked and appalled. But statistically, historically, factually, communism has a far higher death count and murder rate and genocide rate than Nazism ever did. We could account for Nazism causing the death of 40-odd million people. The death count for 20th century communism was in the hundreds of millions. It was 70 million murdered alone in Russia under the communists, and there were starvations uh, in the Ukraine. There were starvations, mass starvation with the collectivized farm policies of Mao and Stalin in the Ukraine and in China, of course. And there were the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. The list sort of goes on and on. The democide or the murder of citizens by their own governments, which largely fueled by communism. Now, of course, people on the left uh, are very prevalent in the media. They tend to be socialists slash communists, and so they tend to cover up these crimes. And this is why you see you know, guys with pictures of Karl Marx and, and Che Guevara, where they wouldn't have a picture of Hitler and so on. And Hitler is, of course, rightly denigrated as evil. But you can't even use the correct name of the Nazi party in Germany. Nazism uh, is a short form of national socialism, and you have to use Nazism so that the word socialism is not clouded with the accurate. You, you, you pretend that communism is on the left and fascism is on the right and so on. But there's only one pole to totalitarianism versus economic and political freedom. And so there's this supposed opposite uh, pole polarity between communism and fascism, but uh, it's not really the case. The Nazis were national socialists and the communists were communist socialists. And uh, so anybody who follows the communist ideology is wrapped up in an ideology that was one of the most savage mental viruses to ever steal the life of hundreds of millions of people around the world. And... Um, you can find YouTube videos of Nelson Mandela singing songs about the endless murders of white people that he thought was uh, a great thing to, to happen. Uh, so I think this is all really important stuff to understand. Now, as a committed communist, when Nelson Mandela took power in 1994 in South Africa, he instituted the usual grab bag of suicidal socialist economic policies. He nationalized the banks. He nationalized corporations. He nationalized the excavation of natural resources, and so on, thus causing a massive and catastrophic collapse in the economy. And everybody who was chanting, you know, uh, end apartheid and so on, I mean, if you really care about blacks in Africa, then you stick around after your supposed glorious revolution and find out what actually happened when the evil whites were driven out of power. And now uh, there is a growing nostalgia for apartheid, uh, which basically ran from 1948 until the 90, early 90s. And 60% of South Africans now feel that the country was better run under apartheid, with both blacks and whites rated the current government less trustworthy, more corrupt, less able to enforce the law, and less able to deliver government services than its white predecessor. Transparency International released its 2013 Global Corruption Barometer report, finding South Africa to be among the most corrupt countries in the world. According to its findings, an astounding 83% of South Africans believe that the police force is corrupt. 36% of respondents admitted to paying at least one bribe to the uh, police. Uh, every day in South Africa, there are 59 murders, 145 rapes, and 752 serious assaults. Uh, this is uh, all that is reported. A 2010 Medical Research Foundation survey found that more than 37% of men in South Africa admitted to raping at least one woman, 7% they had said they had participated in gang rape. This is, uh, of course, absolutely appalling. There's a new common crime, the witch doctors say, because, of course, there's uh, many people infected with AIDS. It's the rape of babies, believe that having sex with a virgin is uh, a cure for AIDS. Uh, and, of course, 12% of South Africa's population is HIV positive. President Mbeki says that HIV cannot cause AIDS. 
uh, and that the cure uh, is perceived among uh, lots of people to be sex with a virgin, which creates enormous drivers towards the sexual rape or the rape of, of children. In response to growing violence, South Africa's Minister of Safety and Security, Steve Chtwede, says, we can't police this. There's nothing more we can do. South Africa's currency, the rand, has fallen about 70% since the ANC came to power in 1994. Emigration from South Africa, mainly of skilled people, is now at its highest level ever. And according to some black writers, the fact of business that is tragic, ordinary Africans were better off under colonialism. Colonial masters uh, never committed anything near the murder and genocide seen under black rule in Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Nigeria, Mozambique, and other countries. Millions of blacks have been slaughtered in unspeakable ways, including hacking to death, boiling an oil setting, being set on fire and dismembered. And uh, Mandela's been married three times, most recent, recently when he was 80. His second wife, Winnie Mandela, was about as evil a human being as you can imagine. Uh, she was um, convicted of the torture and murder of a 14-year-old boy who can, she considered or called an informant. Uh, she was a big fan of what is called necklacing, which is a revolting practice wherein uh, somebody you think is negative to the cause of black liberation, uh, you wrap them in barbed wire, you jam a tire over their shoulders so they can't move, you pour gasoline into the rim of the tire and you set fire to it, melting their face off, causing their eyeballs to explode and having them die in unbelievably agonizing ways. And um, Mandela's wife was uh, a big fan of this, uh, repeated it many times, and was convicted at one point. And this is who he married. Um, I believe that a man, to some degree, is known by the company that he keeps. The National Bureau of Economic Research found that the average income of all races in South Africa dropped 40% between 1995 and 2000. You need to hear that again. The National Bureau of Economic Research found that the average income of all races in South Africa dropped 40% between 1995 and 2000. This was under President Nelson Mandela when he nationalized and when he uh, socialized and so on. The UN 2006 Human Development Report found that over the last three decades, Africa has had a virtual reversal of human development. South Africa has dropped 38 places on the Human Develop Development Index since 1994. The country of the first of the world's first heart and uh, heart transplant, the Union of South Africa, is now the rape and murder capital of the world. One in three women will be raped before she reaches the age of 18. One in two women, 50% of the female population, is raped at some point in her lifetime. It is the rape and murder capital of the world. Now, given that most people prefer to be alive and dead, let's look at some of the history of colonialism. At the start of the year 1900, the African South Africans, the black South Africans, there are about three and a half million of them, according to the British colonial government census. By 1954, which was six years after apartheid had started, African population soared to eight and a half million. By 1990, right before the end of apartheid, 35 million uh, blacks. Uh, so a tenfold increase under colonialism and under the apartheid regime, a tenfold increase in the number of blacks. In the decades prior to apartheid, which started in 1948, the average life expectancy of African South Africans was 38 years of age. During the last decade of the apartheid era, the average life expectancy for South African blacks had risen to 64 years, which was on par with Europe's. And unfortunately, since the end of colonialism, and don't, and don't get me wrong, I'm no big fan of colonialism, I'm no big fan of statism at all, I consider it a generally immoral institution, but still we must look at the facts of better and worse. One of the things that's true about Africa, even under apartheid, is that the number of blacks who are struggling and striving and risking life and limb to get into South Africa from other of the crap pop dictatorships, black run dictatorships in Africa was huge. All the blacks in Africa pretty much wanted to get into South Africa. It was by far the safest place to be for a black person uh, in the whole continent, which again is uh, not huge praise for South Africa, but rather endless condemnation for the other dictatorships. A UN report said that Africa is the only continent, it's the only continent where poverty had increased over the past 20 years. If you look at places like China uh, and India, millions and millions and millions of people are climbing out of poverty. If you just look at Nigeria alone, I'm sorry, if you just look at um, 
Nigeria alone, sorry, Nigeria had pushed 71 million people below the poverty line. So the Human Development Index figure is a conglomeration of things that are good for people as a whole, of course. South Africa's Human Development Index numbers were far higher in 1995, after almost 50 years of apartheid rule, than it was in 2010, after 16 years of ANC rule. And the trend continues to be downward. If we look at Zimbabwe, post-colonial life expectancy tumbled from about 60 years in 1990 to about 36 to 44, depending on which statistics you find acceptable, nonetheless um, between a third and a half decline. Last year, South Africa had a murder rate of 30, almost 32 per 100,000 people, 20 times the murder rate of Canada, 27 times the rate of the UK, more than 30 times the rate in Australia and New Zealand. South Africa's murder rate is almost twice as high as Rwanda, Chad, Sierra, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe. Now, for white farmers in South Africa, the murder rate is 99 per 100,000. This makes being a white farmer in South Africa the most dangerous occupation in the world. Naturally, of course, the government is taking guns from people, requiring them to be registered, and then taking half the guns by not registering people, um, which means that they don't have defense. And if you ever want some truly grim reading, you can read about the thousands and thousands of white farmers that have been murdered by blacks in uh, South Africa and other places in Africa. It's truly horrendous and, of course, is completely ignored uh, because they're not, say, rhinos, where if they were murdered in that rate, uh, the left would be all over it. The official unemployment rate in South Africa is 26%. Of course, it's actually a lot higher. Public institutions are almost irredeemably corrupt. Law and order is failing. 74% of people think all public officials and civil servants are corrupt or extremely corrupt. 70% believe the whole political system is corrupt. In other words, uh, South Africa... Um, which Nelson Mandela fought for independence from white rule and then was the first uh, president uh, of South Africa, has become a complete economic crap hole, a complete economic disaster, which is inevitable when you put, I mean, even Vladimir Putin says that whenever people implement socialism, it fails and destroys uh, the economies of every country it's ever tried in, uh, which is why he's sort of pointing out that Barack Obama is sort of pursuing the same course. So, I mean, yes, he's a photogenic guy. He's uh, got a nice smile. I don't know, if I'd been involved in bombing and if I'd started an organization that ended up slaughtering a whole bunch of kids, I'm not sure that having smiley photo ops with the Spice Girls would be number one on my list uh, if I had uh, been addicted to violence uh, as a solution. And, of course, if I had uh, placed myself at the head of a country that was now the number one murder and rape and sexual abuse capital of the world, I am not sure that I would be grinning like a sociopathic idiot uh, all around the world and taking everybody's applause, uh, applause and praise when I had used a lot of violence in my youth, I had refused to renounce violence in my middle age, and I had engendered a system which had destroyed the remaining economy and freedoms of South Africa and resulted in a crime-based society that is only limited by the statistics of crime in South Africa is only limited by the fact that very few people even bother going to the police anymore. The reality is that it is uh, a murder pit and a rape pit, the entire country, pretty much. Now, I think it's enormously dangerous to venerate this. I sort of make this last point that when you live in a profoundly sick society, and we do, frankly, live in a profoundly sick society, you have to be very wary of people venerated by sick societies. Uh, sick, evil, immoral, wretched societies tend not to worship really moral, virtuous, stand-up kind of people. So when you see a lot of praise coming out of the media for Nelson Mandela, you have to be very careful. It's like the praise that was given to Gandhi, which perhaps we can do another show on, uh, another charlatan and an extremely dangerous human being. <clears throat> so you really do have to be quite skeptical. Uh, I think it's very dangerous to venerate somebody who was so committed to violence and who used such violence in the seizure of private property as the president of South Africa in pursuit of his socialist, um, which is basically a theft-based political agenda. You really do have to be careful when he did not renounce violence, when he enthusiastically sang songs about murdering whites. Uh, this is a very dangerous person to hold up because I'm telling you people, there are young people the world over who are constantly scanning for the values of society. And if you praise somebody committed to violence who had a violent regime, who, whose regime has resulted in 
uh, more violence than was ever imaginable under the apartheid system, well, whoever you praise, the youth will emulate. Whoever you venerate, the youth will become. Please take care in who you praise.